She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. Today we're talking about another unsolved case that has been driving me crazy because literally no one has covered it. Um, it's been very difficult to even find anything about it online. And I mean, I scoured newspapers.com even to, you know, hope and find an article with small bits of information, like even a small article. And as far as I could tell, there wasn't anything. There aren't even any Reddit threads about it, uh, which is crazy. But Crime Watch Daily did make a video about the case a few years back, and I used that as a great starting point, and I was able to find out enough to create a video for you today and hopefully raise more awareness for this victim. But like I said, there's pretty much nothing out there about this woman, and that kind of pissed me off and made me want to make this video more, even though I do like to have a lot of details. I, I wanted to make this video more because somebody knows something and nobody's saying anything and this woman is dead and no one's come forward, no one's been arrested, no one's been convicted of her murder. So our victim today is Sandy Long. She seemed like the sweetest woman ever and I know, you know, no one's perfect. Everybody's got their skeletons, everybody's got their issues, but she seemed like a genuinely really nice woman. And a woman who really deserves to have her case be solved and her killer brought to justice. But before we dive in, today's video is brought to you by our sponsor, Magellan TV. If you like documentaries, Magellan TV is the place for you. It's a new type of documentary streaming service created by those who know what makes a compelling film, documentary filmmakers themselves. They currently have over 3,000 documentary films and series on Magellan TV, and they add more every single week. One of my personal favorite things to do when I open the Magellan TV app is to go into the new releases section and see what they've added. And on that note, for those of you who already signed up or who are considering signing up, I have an amazing recommendation for you. I have to admit it's not true crime, but I found it so breathtaking, so beautiful and interesting. I learned so much, so I had to tell you about it. It's a series called Italy from Above, and it's basically showing you the entire country from an aerial perspective, an aerial view. And it has this gorgeous footage of Italy's ancient villages, picturesque countrysides, posh cities. And I tell you what, I learned so much, not only about the geography, but about the history and it's amazing. I cannot say it enough. I absolutely loved it. I watched all the episodes. I think there was like 11. And I will watch every single one again because there's just so much in there that I feel like I didn't even get the full spectrum of because I was trying to work while I was watching and listening. So I'm definitely going to watch it again and give it 100% of my full attention. Sicily is the largest island in the Mediterranean and an autonomous region of Italy. The economy here is driven by agriculture, with citrus fruits, olives, and wine cultivation, as well as an increasing emphasis on tourism. The island has a beautiful coastline, great historical buildings, as well as some of the most dramatic hilltop villages. Whether you're interested in true crime, history, science, nature, or really anything else, Magellan TV is more than enough to keep you entertained and educated. And you can watch Magellan TV anytime, anywhere on your smartphone, tablet, laptop, even your television, your smart TV. You can start a film on your phone and finish it later on your smart TV without losing your place. And Magellan TV is offering viewers of this channel a one-month free trial. And all you have to do is click the link in the description box and start watching. There's no strings attached. 
no contracts to sign, no tricks. You can cancel any time before the trial ends, but I don't think you're going to want to because once you get in and get started, Magellan TV has so much. There's so much to see. It'll be hard to stop watching. I've gone through a lot of the true crime content, and now I'm branching off into like the science content and um, the history especially because I love history. So there's just a lot. I, I can't imagine a time where I'll ever go on that app and say, I've run out of things to watch. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video, and let's jump back in. So in November of 2010, Sandy Long was a 41-year-old woman living in Lusby, Maryland with her husband, Lewis, and her two teenage daughters. Sandy, outside of her husband, had a huge family. I'm talking nieces and cousins and sisters and aunts, and a lot of them actually lived very close by to her. Sandy's aunt lived right next door, so they were all very close. They spent a lot of time together. And Sandy was described as funny, spunky, incredibly giving and kind. She loved to cook, she loved to dance, and she loved Chuck Brown. In fact, I think she met him once, and there's a picture I found of her on social media with Chuck Brown, which I think is really cool. So it seemed like Sandy was the kind of person who felt most at ease when she was in her own kitchen, surrounded by family and loved ones, cooking for them, laughing, having a good time, singing and dancing. Sandy was also an avid churchgoer, and her family said that she had a very big heart. She'd give someone her last dollar if she thought they needed it. Um, my sister Sandy was uh, very considerate. Um, she loved people. Um, her, her job that um, she took care of people and she went above and beyond um, the call of duty when it came to her job. Um, very conscientious of, of things. Um, she was also um, full of laughter. Um, just fun to be around. Um, we um, kind of look forward to when we had things at the house that her being there because she was sort of like the life of every of the, of the party of our, our events that we had. And her job was also very important, not only to her, but to the people of her community. She worked for ARC, A-R-C, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the rights and quality of life of people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. I know here, I think the ARC goes by county, so there'll be um, an ARC of Monroe County or an ARC of um, Wayne County, things like that. So every county has their own ARC or should, and it seems like it's that way across the board at least in the United States. Sandy's job was to drive ARC clients to and from their jobs every day, and she took this very seriously. She was very dependable and responsible, which is why her family was sure that something was wrong on November 30th, 2010, when Sandy's first client of the day called in and said that Sandy had never arrived at the scheduled time to pick him up. Uh, she left and checked in with ARC, was heading toward picking up her, her client, and uh, never showed to pick up the client. She was about five miles away from that location. Uh, she never showed she was late, so they started calling around. The client's uh, uh, parent called around and uh, couldn't get an answer, couldn't, couldn't make any contact with her. Sandy's husband, Lewis, said that he'd seen her, you know, get ready and leave for work that morning, and she seemed completely normal. Sandy's aunt, Annie Chase, who lived next door, also saw Sandy leaving for work that morning, and the two women exchanged pleasantries, waved to each other, etc. At 8 a.m., Sandy clocked into work using her cell phone, but then after that, her cell phone was never used again. Not for calls, not for texts, not for anything. When Louis Long, Sandy's husband, heard that she'd missed her first client, he rushed right home because he knew that this was out of character for his wife. She was very punctual, you know, always on time. And if she ever changed her plans, she would tell him. At 2.30 in the afternoon this same day, a group of hunters saw a silver 2009 Ford Focus in the dirt parking lot of Calvert's Cliff State Park, less than two miles away from the home of Sandy Long. Inside the car, they saw a woman laying across the front seats with one leg up in the air and at first they thought maybe she was just sleeping. But as they got closer, they noticed the blood and they called 911. Sandy had been murdered, stabbed violently. There were multiple lacerations to her neck, chest, and legs, as well as minor abrasions on her hands. 
There was blood all over the car, on the floor, inside the cup holder. And the detective who was assigned to this case, Sergeant David Sexton, he said that in his opinion, it was a crime of passion. And the person who did this to Sandy had most likely been someone she had known. At some point, about 2.30 in the afternoon that same day, some hunters were pulling into a parking lot right near Calvert Cliffs State Park, right off of uh, Camp Kanoy Road and H.G. Truman. And they found Sandra's car, which is a, uh, a silver-colored Ford Focus, and they, they found Sandra Long inside the car, called police, uh, and, the investig- and the investigation began uh, because she was uh, in the car, deceased, and it was a result of a homicide. How was she killed? It was a blunt force trauma. Um, uh, homicide, and um, we we feel like it was probably a crime of passion. Uh, she had some extensive injuries, uh, and um, the homicide unit was called. Uh, we worked extensively on interviewing family and friends and coworkers, and any anyone that she had any kind of relationship with. Other than the fact that I think that this person was very close to her. And maybe something happened where she just didn't want them that close. The family was questioned, and literally no one could think of anyone who would want to do this to Sandy. She was such a kind person, loved so much by everyone in her life. Everyone racked their brains, and they couldn't even think of anyone that she'd had issues with. Sandy had no enemies. Who do you think would have done something like this to your sister? Um, I I couldn't fathom um, anyone you know, doing um, such a brutal um, thing to Sandy because she, Sandy was a person that, um, she didn't, she wouldn't hurt a fly. She, um, like I said, she gave, she didn't take. um, She was one that would take the shirt off of her back to to help you. So um, to find out, you know, that was her in the car and and the family, none of us could believe that, you know, such a, a horrific, you know, thing could happen to her because she was, she was just a, a person that you would never have dreamt of that she had, you know, any enemies. Now, Sergeant Sexton, after investigating the case, came to some conclusions about what he believed may have happened. He thought that after Sandy had left for work, she'd spotted someone she knew on the road, and she'd pulled over either to talk to this person or to offer them a ride. Now, her family claimed that they did not believe Sandy would stop to pick up a stranger or to pick up a hitchhiker, which I think is a little bit contradictory because initially, you know, when they're talking about what a good person she was, they they said she'd give someone her last dollar if if she thought they needed it. So in my opinion, she does seem like the type of person who might stop and maybe not pick up a hitchhiker, but if she saw someone on the side of the road who appeared to be injured or who appeared to need help, I do think that she is somebody who would have stopped based on the description given by her family. But something else that adds to the theory that it was someone she knew was the fact that there was no sign anything had been taken. Her car was obviously still there, so this wasn't a carjacking. Her purse was found in the trunk, so it hadn't been a robbery. As far as investigators could tell, nothing was missing from Sandy's person or her vehicle. On top of that, Sergeant Sexton believed that whoever had done this to Sandy wanted her to be found. It is his theory that after she picked this person up, they murdered her and then drove her car and her body to the parking lot where it was found. Then her attacker parked the car, got out, and walked away, leaving Sandy to be found, making no effort to conceal his or her crime. And when I say no effort to conceal the crime, Obviously, this person specifically drove the car to this place for a reason, most likely because it was out of the way. And I also have to wonder if there was maybe a lack of security cameras in the area and this person knew that there was no security cameras in this area because typically it's going to be more of a residential or business area. There, There will be a lot of cameras around. So it wouldn't have made sense to drive to a more densely populated area because then as this attacker, you run into the risk of being caught on someone's home security camera camera or a store surveillance camera. But this person, once he or she brought the car to this parking lot, they made no effort to bring Sandy's body anywhere and bury it or conceal it in any way. 
they would have known that she would be found sooner rather than later. So someone wanted everyone to know that she was dead. And this will become important later on when we talk about theories. In cases like this, especially when the police suspect the attacker might be someone the victim knew, close family members are obviously going to be thoroughly looked into, especially the spouse. And in this case, Sandy's husband, Lewis, he had been at work that day and investigators confirmed his alibi. He was very cooperative with detectives. He gave his fingerprints, his DNA, and he took and passed a polygraph exam. He insisted he had nothing to do with his wife's murder He said he loved her and he had no reason to want to hurt her. However, some members of Sandy's family had claimed that she was acting differently in the month before her murder. Sandy was found dead on a Tuesday, and the Sunday before, she'd been at church during an exceptionally emotional sermon, and some members of her family had witnessed her crying during the service. Other family members said Sandy had become withdrawn, quiet, and distant. Her niece Karen had been with her both the Sunday and Monday before her death, and Karen had felt that something had been wrong, but she didn't ask Sandy if she was okay because she assumed that Sandy was going through, you know, personal or family issues and Karen didn't want to pry. Tisa Crowner, Sandy's cousin as well, had also heard that there were some things going on behind closed doors at the long home that were affecting the marriage of Sandy and Lewis. Now, when Lewis was asked about these issues, he said that he'd never laid a hand on his wife. Sure, they would sometimes say hurtful things to each other during fights, you know, like any couple, but he claimed it was never anything more than that. Sandy's family members said a lot of the time it seemed like Sandy was just trying to make everything work and be happy, but in the end, she wasn't. Sergeant Sexton makes mention that Lewis, Sandy's husband, may have been a bit controlling and that he also liked to drink and have his friends over to the house a lot, but there's no confirmation of that from anybody else. I don't know if Lewis was ever asked if this was true. But since the police officer did say it, I'd assume that he did his due diligence before making a claim like that. Okay, so as a heads up, there's going to be a bunch of stuff we talk about going forward, and a lot of it comes from allegations, rumors, gossip, things like that. There's going to be some facts sprinkled in here and there, you know, and I'll be very clear about which are which because everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Now, it came to the attention of the police that even though there was no proof of domestic violence in the marriage of Sandy and Lewis, there had been some allegations from one of Sandy's teenage daughters, whose name was Kiana. Now, both of Sandy's daughters were from a previous relationship, so they were not Lewis's daughters by blood. Kiana told True Crime Daily that her stepfather had come into her bedroom one night and touched her butt, and then made a move to touch the front of her, And at that point, she claims she pulled away, and she even thinks that she jumped onto the bed and ran out of the room to get away from him. Now, according to Kiana, this happened just once. It was not a regular occurrence, but it obviously caused some issues in the household when she informed her mother what had happened. Tensions between Kiana and Lewis were reaching a boiling point, and according to Sergeant David Sexton, they, they reached a head when a physical argument broke out between Lewis and Kiana where the police had to be called. Now, this case almost went to court, but apparently Sandy stepped in and tried to be a mediator. The episode on True Crime Daily suggests that Sandy took her husband's side over her daughter's. But it was also mentioned that Sandy just really wanted her family to be okay and to get along. But This apparently and obviously upset Kiana, understandably so. Now, Lewis denies that he was ever inappropriate with Kiana. He claims that she was just going through stuff in her life that made her say these things, but that they were not true. I want to be very clear that I'm not assuming one way or the other. There's not enough information available to me or anyone besides maybe the police, who I'm sure do have much more information on the situation. So there's not even enough information that I have to even make an educated guess on, you know, what the actual truth could be. But um, I think we can all agree that this would be a tough situation for a family to be in either way. And once again, either way, Sandy would have found herself in a very tough spot in the middle between her child and her husband. Now, remember I said that Sandy was reported to have been 
out of sorts in the weeks leading up to her murder, especially those last couple of weeks where her family members reported that she wasn't happy, she was crying at church, she'd become distant. Police feel that aside from the issues between Kiana and Lewis, they may have discovered another reason for Sandy's change in behavior. It appeared that Sandy had been having an extramarital affair with another man, a married man, and she had just ended the relationship a month before her murder. So obviously, the introduction of another person into this case adds another element. Was she killed by a jealous lover who couldn't stand to lose her? Or was she killed by her husband because he found out about it? According to Lewis, he had no idea his wife was having an affair, but it did seem like some members of her family were aware of that fact, and they had withheld it from police for almost a week because they didn't want to see Sandy painted in a negative light. Detectives tracked down this man at his home, and at the time they knocked on his door to question him, his wife was not home, lucky for him, and he was cooperative with the police. He told them he didn't know anything, and he answered all their questions as well as giving them an alibi. The police checked out his alibi by talking to his employer and getting a warrant for the GPS on his vehicle, which showed that early on the morning of November 30th, this man, Sandy's boyfriend, had been in Washington, D.C., so he could not have been in Lusby, Maryland, which was about an hour and 20 minutes away. So personally, I'm over here thinking an hour and 20 minutes isn't a terribly long way to drive, and it could easily be done, but I'm sure the police have more from that GPS unit. Maybe they show where he was all day, or you know, maybe they have cell phone coordinates that show where he was all day. Or I would hope he wouldn't have been eliminated as a suspect, but in exchange for his cooperation, Sandy's lover had one request, that the police not expose his infidelity. And according to Sergeant Sexton, they didn't tell his wife, and she never found out. So uh, two things here. First of all, can you imagine being the woman, the wife of this man, and you're just watching True Crime Daily on YouTube one day and being like, wait, wait, are they talking about my husband? Like, I think he knew the Sandy woman from work, or I think he knew the Sandy woman from church or something. So are they talking about my husband? You know, just to like put two and two together and find out that way, instead of him just being honest and upfront and telling you. Secondly, I'm a little surprised that the police didn't um, tell the wife, not just to be petty, but for the fact that who knows if she knew about the affair. It's very possible that even though she didn't tell her husband she knew, she did know, which would make her a suspect, in my opinion. I guess it's just weird to me uh, for the police to be like, oh, well, you claim your wife didn't know, so she must not have. Let's move on. Because in my opinion, if she did know, then she would be considered a suspect. So they probably should have checked and clarified with her if she knew or not, or at least questioned her and gotten like, her whereabouts on that day. But it's just my opinion. Let's move on. So Lewis, Sandy's husband, said he didn't know about Sandy's affair. And there was something else his wife had been up to that he claimed to have no knowledge of. Before she'd died, Sandy had taken out a $50,000 life insurance policy on herself, naming her two daughters as the benefactors. Now, Sandy worried that if anything ever happened to her, her husband, Lewis, would not make sure that her daughters were taken care of because they were technically not his daughters by blood. So she got this life insurance policy for them. And then she also named one of her sisters, Joyce, as benefactor, hoping that if something happened to her, Joyce would sort of like slip into that mother role and take care of them. Now, when Lewis was interviewed by True Crime Daily, he claimed to have no idea that the life insurance policy existed at all. So this dude is allegedly, allegedly finding out all sorts of stuff about his late wife. The fact that she was involved with another man behind his back. The fact that she'd taken out a life insurance policy on herself without telling him. But to me, the fact that Sandy felt the need to take out this life insurance policy, in my opinion, says a lot about not only her relationship with her husband, but about her husband's relationship with her daughter's. My oldest daughter, who's a teenager now, is not biologically the child of my husband, even though my two youngest children are. And I understand completely the challenges and dynamics of this sort of family unit. I've lived it. And it wasn't always perfect. It was hard sometimes, especially in the beginning. But if I died tomorrow, 
I would never doubt or question that my husband would make sure that my eldest daughter was taken care of emotionally and financially. He would treat her as if, you know, she was his own out of love for her and respect for me. So I think it does give us a little peek into the the home life of Sandy and Lewis, like behind the scenes, behind closed doors. And it makes me wonder if there was some resentment there on one or both parts. There was obviously a lack of trust on Sandy's part. She didn't trust him to take care of her daughters if something happened. She didn't trust him enough to even tell him that she'd taken out this life insurance policy for her daughters. Why? Why didn't she trust him enough to tell him that? Did she think he would get upset? Why would he get upset for her taking out a life insurance policy to make sure her kids were taken care of? And once again, I'm not saying Lewis is guilty of anything. This could be just a complete perception on Sandy's part that she felt she couldn't trust him, that she felt he would be upset, and maybe he wouldn't have been. Who knows? But the other reason I bring up this life insurance policy is because DNA was found in Sandy's car, specifically from the steering wheel of her car, because once again, the police believed that Sandy's attacker had killed her and then driven her car to the parking lot where it was later found. Two DNA profiles were recovered from the steering wheel, Sandy's own DNA and a man's, a man named Sammy Weems, who, as it turns out, is married to Sandy's sister, Joyce, who, as it turns out, was named as a benefactor on Sandy's life insurance policy. And I have to assume that Joyce knew she was the beneficiary of Sandy's life insurance policy, her sister Sandy's life insurance policy, because she was going to be expected to help take care of Sandy's daughters if anything ever happened to Sandy. So two DNA profiles were found in that car. I mean, only two. No one else's DNA was found in that car. Not Sandy's daughters, not her husband Lewis's, or any other family members. Just Sandy's and Sammy's. Not only that, but Sammy and Joyce lived right around the corner from Sandy. As I said, many of her family members lived close by. And additionally, Sammy's brother, Zetham Weems, lived right on the road that Sandy would have taken that day um, when she was going to work to pick up her first client the day she was murdered. So apparently, before they tested this DNA and got the results back, the police had talked to Sammy as they had talked to most of Sandy's family. And he had told them early on that, yes, he'd been in Sandy's car before as he would often help her um, by backing it out of the driveway for her, which I don't think is improbable at all. My mother lives on a hill and her driveway is long and precarious. So whenever I'm there, I always have my brother or my brother-in-law pull my car out for me because if I backed it out myself, I'd be hitting every mailbox and every tree on the way down. It would be bad. Now, however, Detective Sexton claimed that the state forensic lab said that Sammy's DNA in the car suggested he'd spent more time inside the car than it would take for him to just back it down the driveway. According to the National Institute for Justice, based on the location of where DNA is found, it can be from multiple sources. Since this particular DNA was found on a steering wheel and not Sandy's body, The most likely source of the DNA was probably from skin cells, saliva, sweat, or hair. I'm guessing it was skin cells or sweat because we don't realize that we're always shedding skin cells because it's gross to think about. So pretty much everything we touch, we are leaving a little bit of ourselves behind, but it could have, you know, also been from sweat, which is also likely. I am a little confused as to why the forensic lab would say the DNA found in Sandy's car would suggest Sammy had been inside for longer than it would take to back the car out of the driveway. Because once again, according to the National Institute for Justice, there's no way to tell based on DNA or fingerprints when the suspect was at the scene or for how long they remained at the scene. In my opinion, this was either an inaccurate statement or law enforcement has more information that they haven't shared due to legal reasons or for fear of compromising the investigation. I'm hoping it's the latter because to make such an inaccurate statement would be very irresponsible. Um, on behalf of the state crime lab, but who knows? There may have been more DNA found in other places other than the steering wheel, I mean, and that DNA could have belonged to Sammy, so it could have been like in the back seat, it could have been in the trunk, it could have been um, on door handles, on things like that, and that's why they assumed that he'd been in the car longer than just backing it down. But if that's the case, they haven't released that or revealed it. Once Sammy Weems' DNA was found in the car, Detective Sexton claims Sammy shut down and became uncooperative. 
He was asked to come in and talk to the police, but he declined. However, his wife and Sandy's sister, Joyce, did take a polygraph exam and passed. Detective Sexton does want to make it clear that Sammy Weems has never been named as a suspect or even a person of interest in this case, but the end goal of law enforcement is to get him into the station and talk to him about his sister-in-law and her murder, and he's not willing to do that. This could be because he was involved, but it could also be because his DNA was found in her car, which was technically the crime scene, and he's trying to avoid having a murder pinned on him that he did not commit simply because he helped his sister-in-law pull out of the driveway once in a while. And both of these make sense to me considering the circumstances. So True Crime Daily actually tracked Sammy Weems down one day while he was out grocery shopping at the store. And they asked him, you know, what did he think about his sister-in-law's murder? And he basically said that he has no idea what happened to her or who could have done it. But he didn't see anything that day and he wasn't involved. Sammy also made allegations about both the police involved in the case as well as the family of Sandy Long, who I guess in a way, would also be his family, at least by marriage, you know? I mean, I don't know if Sammy and Joyce are still married at the time that he gave this statement to True Crime Daily, but um, at the very least, it's his wife's family, and the things he said is crazy. I would... I have to believe that they're not married any longer because if he said that stuff and they were still married, it's going to be very awkward Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners. But let's start with what Sammy said about the police. According to Sammy, he felt that Detective Sexton had been harassing him, essentially. Uh, Sexton had basically showed up to his home multiple times, even after he told the police that he'd felt he helped the investigation all he could by giving his DNA and telling them what he knew. Sammy basically said that he doesn't know why he and his family are still being bothered by the police. And the last time Sexton showed up, his brother, who I assume is Zetham, told him basically to stick it, like told Detective Sexton to leave. We're not helping you. So Sammy said that if the police went back over the case and started re-interviewing people, he would probably not want to be a part of that. Now about Sandy's family, Sammy came right out and said that they were a sick group of people and he made allegations that this family has a history of having sex with each other and marrying each other. Now I would like to be very clear once again, that these allegations are unsubstantiated, but he did make these statements public, so I'm just repeating them to you, and I think it it does give some insight into, once again, a family dynamic. Sammy also went on to say that he believed the key to what happened to Sandy lay with her husband, Louis, and her daughter, Kiana, and what transpired between them. Now, in the summer of 2016, Kiana claimed that Detective Sexton approached her and asked her to take a polygraph, which she agreed to do. But when asked if she had anything to do with her mother's death and she said she didn't, apparently the polygraph showed deception. And Kiana alleges that Detective Sexton basically accused her of killing her mother. Now, here's my problem with this. If the fact that she failed and Detective Sexton accused her of murdering her mother, if that's all true... It seems um, like law enforcement has a tendency to use polygraph tests to fit the narrative that they want. So if someone passes a test, they're like, that's great. But law enforcement and a potential prosecutor in a criminal case will still say that passing the test doesn't mean you're innocent since polygraphs are generally not admissible in court anyways. But if what Kiana is saying is accurate, that she failed hers and Sexton proceeded to accuse her of killing her mother, it looks as if he's putting more weight into her failed polygraph than he should be. Or he has this narrative, he has this idea of what happened, such as Sandy was killed by someone she knew. He was aware of the issue between Kiana and Lewis. He was aware that Kiana would have probably been upset about that and by default been upset with her mother. And he was trying to get her to confess by making her feel that he put more weight into the polygraph. For anyone watching this, if you're ever in a situation where a police officer wants you to take a polygraph test, you can say no. And you should always consult with a lawyer first. And like I said, it's well within your rights to say no. This does not mean you're guilty, nor should it make you look more suspicious in the eyes of law enforcement or anyone. 
It seemed like, at least at the point of True Crime Daily covering this case, many members of Sandy's family hadn't even known that Joyce's husband, Sammy's DNA, was found in Sandy's vehicle. The show gathered 13 members of Sandy's family together. Some knew that DNA was found in the car, but not all of them knew that it was Sammy Weems' DNA. Sandy's niece, Glenda, said she knew who the DNA belonged to, but she didn't feel comfortable talking about it in front of the family members who did not. So the show's producers basically asked all those who didn't know to step out of the room. And this left only Glinda and Sammy's cousin, Tiza, the only two members of the family who seemed to be aware not only that Sammy's DNA was in the car, but that he wasn't really cooperating. And they claimed that it upset and confused them that he wouldn't take a polygraph and he wasn't talking to police. Sandy's husband, Lewis, also told True Crime Daily that he believes many people in his community think he did this to his wife and he doesn't know what else to do to prove his innocence. You know, he's done all he can. He cooperated with law enforcement. He gave his DNA. He gave his fingerprints. He took a polygraph. And law enforcement has never named him as a suspect or a person of interest and his alibi checked out. But... Of course, you know, there's always going to be those people who say that even though he didn't do it himself, he could have hired someone to do it or he could have been working with someone who did it. Of course, those are always going to be theories. In my opinion, I think the police definitely feel, at least they feel that they know who committed this murder. So I don't want to say they know who who committed the murder, but they feel that they do. They just don't have enough evidence to prosecute. So they might have enough evidence to make an arrest, but outside of that, once it goes to court, whatever evidence they have, it won't stick. And I think that's where the issue is, and I think that's why this case is still unsolved. But it bothers me that this case is still unsolved because it seems like there's a lot of people involved here, and a lot of people know more than they're saying, and there's everybody's specific reasons for not talking, maybe like like we said earlier, when um, Sandy's family didn't tell police that she'd been having an affair because they didn't want her to, you know, we painted in a negative light to the public. Maybe there's more that they know that they're not saying because of the way it'll make Sandy look or the way it'll make their whole family look. And I'm not saying that Sandy's family doesn't want this solved. I'm sure Sandy's family wants this solved more than I do, more than anyone else does. But until someone speaks up, until someone says what they know, it's going to be at a stalemate. And that's where I want to direct you to the description box, because if you have information on the murder of Sandy Long, I've placed resources for you in the description box where you can call in a tip anonymously, where you can send a message. If you know something, say something. And now I hand it off to you all in the comments. Let me know what you think about this case. Let me know if you've ever heard of it. Let me know what you think your theory is. Let me know what could potentially be done to shine more light on this case. Share the video. If you think it's worth sharing, like it if you liked it. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you've already subscribed, make sure you are still subscribed because YouTube unsubscribes people from my channel all the time. Also in the description box, you'll find the link to subscribe to Crime Weekly, my podcast that I co-host with retired police detective Derek Levasseur. Thank you guys so much for being here. Make sure to let me know what you think in the comment section. Make sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Handles are in the description box. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and I'll see you very, very soon. I got blood, blood on the strings